Hallelujah, Lord. We give you all the praise, Lord. You are holy. You're holy, Lord. Set apart. Set apart from all the things of this world. Set apart from sin. Set apart from all that is unrighteous. And yet, Lord, even though you're set apart from all that, you're right here. You're right here in our midst. And I thank you, Lord, that we have been able to worship you, to invoke your presence. As your word says, wherever two or more are gathered, there you are. And that you inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, you are holy. Lord, we just thank you, God, that you're holy and pure and perfect. Lord, I pray that today in all that we hear in a way of a message and all that we would share in fellowship and greeting one another, Lord, would be, be holy like you. We ask for your will to be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, let's take a few minutes and greet each other this morning. Oh, good morning. You are welcome. If you are with us today for the first time in your seat back in front of you, there's a card that looks like this called the Connect card. Fill it out on the conclusion of service. Go to our information desk, and we have a bag full of goodies that we'd like you to take home. Now, goodies, that doesn't mean treats to eat on the way home. But they're, they're good gifts. We want you to have them. So please take time during the service, fill this out, and bring it to the information desk. At this time, we're going to receive this morning's offering. So let's pray, and the ushers will come. Father, we thank you, Lord, for every blessing that you bestow upon us. Lord, we thank you, God, that as we plant seed, you will produce a harvest. That's your word. And I pray that today, Lord God, that we would bring our seed to you and let you do what you do so perfectly. Lord, I pray that you'd bless each gift and each giver, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Um, let me bring you up to speed on some announcements. Uh, we had a great day yesterday with the Lego Derby, as many of you know, especially if you have young kids. Um, and there is, some, there is some stuff that's left over. Um, close the service. There will be cookies and chili for sale. And the proceeds obviously go to Rangers. And I don't know if it's cookies or chili. Or it really should be chili and then cookies, right? You don't get your dessert till you've eaten your chili. So that'll be for sale. I want to remind you about that. Uh, coming up Saturday is Women's Breakfast for February, and that starts at 9 o'clock in the cafe. Uh, also, a number of things begin to happen in March. Uh, March 3rd is our missions convention, and uh, we've got Sam Johnson, founder of Priority One, who's going to be here and give us an update. At night is our international banquet. hope you begin to plan on what you're going to bring. It, it, it always is just a great time. The stuff, you, the stuff you bring, the ethnic dishes that you make are just delicious. So begin scheming and strategizing about what you're going to do. Uh, and also, actually, the Sunday before that is our annual business meeting immediately following this service. So again, third is missions convention. And we have some new offerings for life groups, which is used to be Sunday school, but that's an old-fashioned term, so we have to go to life groups. Um, and I don't know if you got this on your way in, but you should have received the bulletin, of course, which I just mentioned a few things. Worldview Magazine, it's the first Sunday of the month we emphasize missions. Hopefully you got one of those. If you didn't, please do. Find out what we're doing around the world in reaching people for the Lord. Um, also, there is a list of all the life group offerings that begin March 3rd. And there's some, there is some derivation, there's some, some things that are going to be a little different. Uh, and there were a couple other flyers, and these weren't necessarily to be handed out by the greeters, but you can pick one up on your way in. One is Pastor Hans is going to do a nine-week class on teens and money. Okay, this is based on Financial Peace University material. We've subscribed to it. It's for your kids. Get your kids here. This is middle school. Anyone who's in youth group, middle school all the way up through high school. Okay, and it, all the info is on that sheet. Please get one of those. And concurrent with that, I'll be doing a class once again on Parenting 101, nine weeks each. So uh, grab one of those flyers, the topics are on the other side. It does, uh, we will spend considerable time on discipline, um, but there's, there's just a whole lot of information there for parents and for teens. Hope you'll be part of that. So anyways, let's get into the word this morning. And I want you to know that today's topic for Back to Basics is witnessing. We're going to be talking about witnessing, telling others about Jesus and the faith that we have. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that your word and your spirit would work together in our hearts today. God, that you would truly break through, that you'd speak to us in a way that would even go past our intellect that we would have a spiritual knowing concerning the truth of your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, there are two primary passages in the New Testament that give us guidance concerning witnessing to people who do not yet know Christ as Savior. And one of these is from the first chapter of John's Gospel, and the other is going to be from the last chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And so I want us to begin by reading from John chapter 1, and we'll pick up at verse 35. John 1, verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. His two disciples followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. And so they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, you know, each one of us become born again in our own unique way. Every one of us has a unique testimony, a, a unique story of how we found Christ, how we came to Christ, how we gave our hearts to him. 
And in just a few verses, we have read about two such people, John's disciples, who, who had spent time with Jesus. And more importantly, we see how one of these two men was instrumental in bringing yet another person to the knowledge of Jesus being the Messiah. We're told here, Andrew was one of those who heard John. He was talking, he was, he was with John, he followed John, and, and John said, behold, the Lamb of God, there's the Lamb of God, and he decided to follow Jesus. He was compelled to put his faith in Jesus Christ because of John's declaration that Jesus was the Messiah, the Lamb of God. But it doesn't stop there. Once Andrew realizes that Jesus is the Messiah, and we read this, the very first thing that he does is to go to get his brother Simon. Verse 41 said, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and to tell him, we have found the Messiah. I'm so glad that it's just, it's so clear, it's so definitive for us. The first thing he did, once he found out that this man, Jesus, is the Messiah, is to tell his brother. Now, concerning my own experience, I had to travel 1,500 miles away from home back in 1974 to find Jesus. 1,500 miles from Massachusetts all the way to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Because apparently, for some reason, no one in my hometown, no one in my immediate social circles could tell me or would tell me how to get to heaven. But within a short time of becoming born again, I began to write letters home, trying to explain to my family, to friends, what had happened to me. And again, I'm a brand new Christian, and I'm so excited. I wish I could have been closer to family to go get them and bring them to Jesus, but I'm 1,500 miles away. The best I have is to, is to write a letter. And I'll be honest with you, I was lost. I didn't know really how to describe what had happened to me. But I do remember calling home, and, and this was following the, when, I got, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I remember calling home, and that didn't seem to register to them either. If, if they couldn't understand salvation, how are they going to understand the baptism and the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues? And so I had, I had three and a half months, a little bit frustrated, just really wanting to get home and tell everybody of what I had learned. I understand Andrew's excitement, his enthusiasm. And yet at the same time, that three and a half months was important because during that period, I really got discipled. So that when I got home, I knew how to tell people. I could not wait. And so I got home at Christmas time and I was able to tell my friends and my family in person. And in a short period of time, my mother came to Christ. And within a week or two after that, my two sisters got saved. The first people that I shared the gospel with, just like Andrew, were people that I was related to. That's where you begin. And then I also tried to witness to my friends. And sadly, in my ignorance, I blew it. I blew it. I got to tell you, I wish I could get the opportunity back. It really, it really saddens me to this day. You see, my, my family knew that I had drastically changed. They knew there was something very different. I mean, almost to them, almost scary but something different. In fact, there were times, and I shared this with uh, the Young Adults Life Group this morning. I knew this. There were times uh, I, I shared a bedroom. Originally, uh, my parents lived in a home with two bedrooms and eight children. So mom and dad got their bedroom, and six boys got one bedroom, and two girls got the den, which got turned into a bedroom. And by the way, don't think, I don't know what you think about a den, but this den was the size of a very small bathroom. Just enough for two beds and they could walk to their beds. Very tiny house. Eventually, two brothers moved out, so now we had four boys in one bedroom. So I had a shared bedroom. I just want to get that across. But now and then, it would be me alone. And when I was alone, I'd close that door. And I was so in love with Jesus, man. I'd be praying in there. I'd be praying up a storm. I'd be praying. Until, and I knew, I knew my mother was outside listening. Because she didn't quite understand tongues. Even when she was newly saved, she didn't quite understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she'd be out there listening. She was spying on me to see what kind of things I might be praying for. But again, she gave her heart to Christ as well as did my sisters. But here's where I blew it in witnessing to my buddies. All of my high school buddies drank. But I outpaced them. 
And of course, I'm talking about before Christ, okay? I want to make that clear. <laughs> rarely, rarely did they even want to be out drinking with me because I was a mess. And, you know, I think most of them, I think they probably, they probably couldn't imagine me making it to my next birthday because of the excess and being a teenage alcoholic. But then I went away to college, as I said, 1,500 miles from home, got saved, came back, and I can't wait to tell them. I want to get together with them. I want to tell them about Jesus, this Messiah that I found, just like Andrew telling his brother Simon. I wanted them to have what I had. And so I met them where they were, in a bar. And they'd be drinking, and so... I, I knew I, my, my love for alcohol. I mean, I, I got delivered when I got saved. I just wasn't even interested in it. But I'd order a beer with them and sit with them. And I would just, I'd probably drink that much off the top, just fake it and nurse it. I don't know. I don't know why I did it now when I look back. But I, I know I wanted, I wanted them to know that I was different. But I also wanted them to know that I'm still one of you. I'm still one of them. And so we all sat there and I would gradually tell them, unravel my story, tell them all that Jesus had done for me. And, you know, and, and then I'd get to the point where I'd ask them, I would finally want to ask them, you know, how about you accept Jesus into your life like I did? Why not ask him into your heart? And, and their response was this. You're no different than us. And when I asked them what they meant, they pointed to the beer bottle. Now, you know, that might have been a way out for them. You know what I mean? They knew they could see what I had. I wasn't imbibing the way that they were. But here I'm telling them I don't need that stuff. And yet I, I had one with them. Very simply, and here's the problem. My words and my actions weren't lining up. Now, we all hate hypocrisy. But you know what? Non-Christians really hate it in Christians. <laughs> my intentions were good. I love these guys. I wanted them to, to, to know what I knew. I, I wanted them to be saved. I wanted them to go to church with me. These were my friends. I'd already met the church kids. You know, I found a local church. I didn't want to be their friends. They were like, oh man, they were just so sour and so dour and every other word that has our in it. They were just so, I didn't want, really, I, I really didn't. They were no fun. They were Christians, but they were no fun Christians. I wanted my buddies to become Christians because then we could still have fun. Just not drink. Just not carouse. I didn't want to feel, I didn't want them to feel like I was trying to portray myself as holier than thou. I wanted to, I wanted to be relatable. I wanted to show them that I was one of them still. And it failed. I failed. And then I realized something that Jesus has said in Matthew 5:13. I, 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 I saw it afterwards. I saw it afterwards. Matthew 5, 13, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no good. It's no good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And, and, and so as soon as I was done sharing the gospel with them, because I had lost my saltiness in the process, they were able to trample right over me. I'm telling you guys, they, they ran right over me. Basically, they could have said, you're a hypocrite. They didn't say it, but you could see it. And I feel bad to this day. I really do. I feel bad that my testimony became worthless because of my lack of wisdom, I lost my saltiness. And so today, I can only pray that somehow someone else has come along in their lives. I mean, it's been, this year will be 50 years since I met Christ for the first time. 50 years. And I would hope that in that period of time that someone else has come into their life, maybe somebody at work, maybe a family member got saved. I truly pray that someday I'll see them in heaven. I don't know where they live. I don't know what they're doing. But I really pray that somehow they get saved in spite of my failure. Again, I wasn't, I wasn't intentionally trying to damage my testimony. It was, it was youthfulness. It was just being new in Christ. It was based on ignorance. And I am so sorry for that. But since that day, I learned a lesson that day. And I have become determined never to let it happen again. And, and also, never to let it happen in ministry as a pastor. I think this is my 46th year as a pastor. 
And I've been, I, since that day, really, I'll never let it happen in ministry. And what I mean by this is that I've always tried to hold our church back. This church, my previous church, the church I founded many years ago. I've always tried to hold us back in a good way. And I want you to understand what I mean by this. I don't want us. I've tried my best. I want to keep us away from trying to be too relatable to the world. Because you understand there's supposed to be a difference. There's supposed to be a distinction. There's supposed to be something about us that's just a little bit different that might create some curiosity as it did in my mother and my, my, my two sisters. I do not want us to become so relatable that we lose our testimony. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? And here, you know, because, you know, whether you know this or not, and you'd probably have to visit a lot of other churches to see this, but a lot of churches today have become so consumer oriented. They are so motivated to make everyone just so happy and so just, just so pleased with what they're doing that they've lost their saltiness. Their time of worship, many churches, their time of worship has become nothing more than performance. You want to go to a concert? Go to a concert. This is a church. We're here to worship him. He's our audience. It's not about you. It's not about me. We're giving praises to the king of kings. The pastoral staff in many churches, and I'll do that. I'll go online and I hear something about this church and I look at the staff. Everybody in their photos looks like GQ magazine. Really? If you don't look just right. I mean, I, my, well, I don't try my best. My wife tries her best <laughs> for me. That's the bottom line. I mean, the entire service today in many churches is meant to be entertainment. It's about pleasing the spectator. This is not a spectator church. And if you were here yesterday, you saw it. You never saw so many hands working to make an event successful. This is not about pleasing the spectator. Instead, what we do here, and this is how I want it, is about pleasing God and trying to invoke the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's what we do here. I preached a, a message years ago about how the church should be churchy. Does anybody remember even saying that? The church should be churchy. Think about it. Imagine walking into a store. Imagine the sign above the entrance says Krispy Kreme Donuts. You can't miss that one, right? Because they light up that neon sign. You go and get your free donut. But you walk inside. Wouldn't it be... You, you walk inside. It says Krispy Kreme all over the place. All the neon. And you walk inside. And it's the dry cleaners. I tell you, I would be livid. I would be incensed. I'd call the police. <laughs> I'm looking for my favorite donut. And instead, I'm smelling weird cleaning products. You know, that's just plain wrong on every level. That's cruel. No store owner in the right mind would advertise one thing and then deal in another product. You don't do that. You'd be out of business in a day. Word would spread. And yet a lot of churches are doing that very thing. They're, they're enticing people to come in. They're luring them in with one product. They say they love Jesus. They say they're Christ-focused. I can't tell you how often I see that. But then the facilities and their activities, what they, what they have going on in their meetings, it's, it's, like, it's like you walked into a nightclub. All dark. Black ceilings, black walls, strobing lights, colored lights, fog, a thumping bass beat. And you've heard me preach about this before. I, you know, probably tired of it. But you know what? Not only does that turn off the unsaved, because they see through that. You know, they understand how deceptive that is. They really do. People are a little more sophisticated than we give them credit for. But, so not only does it turn off the unsaved, but I believe it ruins the saved. It spoils them. You see, some Christians today are like the philosophers in Athens that Paul had to deal with in the book of Acts. Remember the ancient Greeks? They were always looking for something new. Paul shows up. Hey, tell us about a new God. Tell us about a new philosophy. Tell us about a new theology. We want to hear. I mean, all they want to hear is new stuff all the time. And they were enraptured with Paul. They couldn't believe. I mean, this is brand new. They'd never heard about Jesus. And you know what? Today, Christians are always looking for the latest and the greatest and the coolest. And all the while, the thing that's missing is solid biblical teaching and integrity because it's being replaced with what itching ears want to hear. And it has spoiled those who are already Christians because they're being given what they want instead of what they need. Believe it or not, the unsaved person in your family, in your neighborhood, they want to go to a church that's churchy. Really, they do. 
They want to go to church as churchy because they want it to be authentic. They don't want the show. Really, they wouldn't mind if the worship team sang half a song off key. Really, I mean, they might get a chuckle, but they would expect that because we're church. We're not Nashville. We're not Branson. We're not Lancaster Music Theater, whatever it's called, the American Music Theater. They understand that we're real people doing real, you know, there's a spiel for a church. Anyways, this church, our church will be what it is as long as I'm your pastor. We need to remain authentic. We may not be perfect, but we are who we are. I'd like to hear about 300 amens on that one, really. I mean, really, we are who we are. Don't pretend to be something you're not. And again, we kick this around in Young Adults Life Group. Just be authentic. Just be real. You're never going to be perfect. You're going to have bad days. And you're not going to be a good witness at work. Don't go in there trying to, you know, you're just nothing phases you. And don't, 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 don't try to manipulate your own emotions. Bottom line, we want Jesus to be preeminent. That means he has to be first. He's who we emphasize. And I want you to know that our church will remain churchy so that you can bring your friends and family into a good place. This is a good place. And ultimately into a relationship with Jesus. That's what it's all about. So anyways, let's get back to Andrew. We need to model his actions. The very first thing Andrew did was to look for his brother, tell him that he'd found the Messiah. And that's something all of us should be doing. Most of us probably have unsaved family members. And more likely, we have family members who used to attend church. Possibly this church, but they've drifted away. They're just doing their own thing. And you don't know what to do. Yeah, you know, number one, pray for them. Pray for unsaved loved ones. Unsaved, you got unsaved loved ones. Because I know one time years ago, I had a sister-in-law here, and I said, let's pray for our unloved saved ones. <laughs> well, she let me know. She let me know I messed up. <coughs> unloved saved ones, yeah. It's, get it right, okay? It's unsaved loved ones. That's how preachers used to say it. Pray for family members that don't know Jesus. Pray for family members who have drifted away. They've just, eh, they just got drawn into a thing. doesn't mean they hate God. Many of them, I mean, you know, they... they don't go to heaven probably, but they need to be part of the body. Go to them. Here's what you need. Go to them and invite them. Andrew told Simon, what did he say to him? Come and see. Come and see. There's no need to strong arm anyone. I'm not asking you to do that. We're not going to go door to door. The minute you go door to door in some kind of campaign, there's a wall up. You know this. Because the people on the other side of the door who don't want to talk to you, they're going to go run and hide. They think you're either Jehovah's Witness or Mormon. So we don't do that anymore. But just give your friends, your family, a very simple invitation. And you can, you can invite them over and over again. Now, don't do it week after week after week. Maybe give them a couple weeks off and say, hey, what do you think? You, know, would you, you just never know. There's going to be that one day they're going to say, yeah, let's do it. Maybe they'll do it just to get you off their back, but they'll do it. And I think you know what I'm talking about. There's a happy medium. There's a balance. Come and see the Messiah. Folks, we have found the greatest truth. We have found the greatest person that there is in the world for all eternity. And his name is Jesus. We're not selling something that's going to fade away. We're not selling something. We're not telling people about something that isn't real. This is incredible. And we need to tell people. Not out of guilt, not out of, you know, some kind of condemnation we put on ourselves. Not because of a quota. We just need to care about people. Come and see the Messiah. The other message here concerning Andrew and Simon is that we really shouldn't overlook our own family members. And um, I know sometimes it can be, they can be the hardest to reach, can't they? Because they really know you. They know you. They know. They know your foibles. They know your flaws. You know, your failures, but yet we need to be concerned about where they're going to spend eternity. We need to be jealous about their eternal fate. Satan wants them. He's jealous for them. I think we need to be jealous for them. We need to be guarded. We need to desire. I want them to come to heaven with me. We need to do whatever we can to get them into the kingdom. And it just starts with come and see. 
You know, so let's not overlook those who are closest to us. One thing that drove me crazy from the time that I got saved, and I really thought it was my own dad. I really, you know, I, I came home, my mother got saved, my sisters got saved, and, and my dad had had such a hard life. I mean, he grew up uh, during the time of the Spanish influenza epidemic that killed millions around the world. He went through the World War I, World War II, the, the, the uh, diphtheria epidemic that hit the U.S. He went through um, the Great Depression. He never went past third grade. He got into fourth grade, quit, went to work full time to help support his immigrant family. I mean, a tough life. And I just, boy, my dad, Dad needs Jesus. And I'd tell him about him. Nah, 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 just kind of, you know. 30 years, 30 years, 30 years. And I just kept thinking. And, he, and my dad, when I was born, he seemed old. I mean, I have a picture. No, I have a picture of him in my office, and he's 50 years old. His hair is whiter than mine, 50 years old. And just a little guy, maybe 90 pounds, came up to about this high on my, less, not even as high as my shoulder. Worked long days. I mean, just. And then my last church, we had a lot of Italians in my last church. And I thought, I know what I'm going to do. Next time he comes down and visit, I'm going to have them talk to him in Italian. Because he was broken English. He was illiterate. And so I set it up where, where two people were talking to him in Italian. And at the end, I thought, here we go. They're, they're leading him to Jesus. And he, didn't, he wasn't interested. So I was thinking for 20-something years that maybe this was a language issue. It was an under, he didn't quite, no, they told him in Italian exactly how to be saved, and he didn't want it. And then thankfully, after I buried my oldest brother, finished the funeral, came back to the house, we're getting ready to drive home. I can't remember, I think we were living in New Jersey at the time. I asked my dad, I said, you know, Dad, this is, his, this is his oldest son. I said, Charlie's in heaven. My brother had accepted Christ six months before he died. He was not a good guy, but he accepted. He was like a thief on the cross. Six months before he passed, he accepted Jesus. And I told my dad, I said, Charlie's in heaven. And if you ever want to see him again, you need to have Jesus in your heart too. And my dad said, okay. <laughs> really that's it we recited the sinner's prayer and of course I don't want to blame everything on Satan but the phone starts ringing right there next to us we ignored it went right to voicemail and it, you know the old tape recording machines so you hear the whole message while I'm praying and he accepted Jesus at 95 years of age excuse me, 89 years of age. And at age 95, he died and he lives forever. 30 years. I was jealous for him. I didn't want this old man to go into an eternity in hell after living on an earth filled with hell. And you know this world is not a nice place. You know, we, we get joy out of certain little things, but... There's a lot of bad stuff in this world. Satan is the prince of this world. And I'm just, 30 years, guys, so keep inviting, keep asking keep, to come to church. If not to come to church, to come to Jesus. Really, to come to Jesus first. But if not, bring them here, because this church is going to be churchy. And then the other passage I want us to consider for this morning is Matthew chapter 28. I want us to start at verse, verse 18. Let's take a look. Whew. Let me get my composure. Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, so again, John's gospel told us, told us to invite, to come and see. This passage says, go and tell. And I, I do like the King James version of this. It says, go ye. It says, go ye. It doesn't say, come ye. 
It says, go ye into all the world. Churches today, I mean, we can advertise our churches for free through social media. We can get the word out about all the events that are happening here at Praise Assembly and every other church can too. But the way that evangelism is supposed to be done and it's been 100% effective for over 2,000 years, still works today. The technique that works best is this. Christians, those who know Christ as their Savior, are supposed to individually go out and tell people who don't yet know Jesus. That's how it works. Social media is only going to do so much. If we bought television ads, they only do so much. It's you and I telling someone else about Jesus and praying with them. It's really that simple. Matthew 28, 19. Go and make disciples of all nations. And the word nations means in, in the Greek means it's, it's a word ethnos and it means people, meaning anybody. We can and we should share the gospel with anybody. Sharing the good news and it should be natural. It should be regular. It should be something that we do. Not forced. But just like all the other basics that we've talked about through January into this month, it should be, it should be natural. Things like reading the Bible should be natural for us. We're Christians. Praying should be natural for us. We're, we're followers of Christ. We want to talk to our Heavenly Father. Being a witness should be a regular event. And I want to remind you, it doesn't always mean talking. It definitely doesn't mean being confrontative. You don't have to debate the gospel. Please, don't do that. You'll win the debate, but you'll lose that soul. Being a witness means acting, behaving, like someone who loves God and believes that Jesus is Savior. That's what it means. It's almost like 1 Peter 3.15. Look at this. And this is how I look at witnessing. 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. You know him as Lord. You love him. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone or anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Isn't that beautiful? With gentleness and respect, I'm just going to reverse that, that whole verse. With gentleness and respect, be prepared to give an answer when someone asks you why you believe the way you believe, the way you act a certain way. With gentleness and respect. You know, it's been a few weeks since I shared on the basics of prayer, but do you remember my main emphasis with sharing about prayer is that what's happened over time is teachers and preachers have made it very mystical they made it super complex to the point where the average Christian struggles with the issue. They, they, and, and, and they now think the same way about witnessing. Witnessing doesn't have to be complex. You, you know what Jesus did for you. As I started out this message, we all have a different story. Just tell your story. What Jesus, what he means to you today. Not just what he may have done for you, but what does he mean to you today. Sharing our faith doesn't have to be complex. It shouldn't be cumbersome. We just need to be ourselves. Understanding that we need to be ready. We need to be ready. We need to be intentional when someone's really open to discussing spiritual things. But you don't have to force it. If it doesn't come up, okay, just pray for them. So let me summarize everything and then we'll close. Okay, let me just summarize this into two points this morning. First, remember that our presentation of the gospel should be natural. Just let it, just let it be natural. Don't get preachy. It should be as simple as telling someone how you found the Messiah, how you found Jesus. That's what Andrew did. You don't need to be a Bible scholar. Don't worry about knowing everything about the Bible. You don't have to. Because then you're going to get into a debate. You're going you're to act like some kind of doctrinal expert. You don't have to do that. Just share your testimony. Just share how, how you today relate to Jesus and be factual. He, he touched your life. For many of us, it was a radical change. But not for everybody. Some of you are raised in Christian households. And, and you can share that too. So I'm convinced, though, that Jesus makes a difference in any, everyone's life, and he'll make a difference in that person's life. That's the first point. Let your presentation be natural. Amen? Amen. Then secondly, our motivation should be biblical. And what the Bible tells us is that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Don't forget that. He is the only way. There are not many ways. There's only one way. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is the only way. Two simple references. All you got to do for today is try to remember the location. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way. He's the way to heaven. I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Does that make sense? 
Very simply, Jesus is the only way. That's what you need. Secondly, and don't ever apologize because they're going to try to get you to back down. Oh, you, there's got to be other ways. No, no, there's only one way. That's what the Bible says. Not you. You don't have any authority on your own. That's what the Bible says. That's what God says. Okay? Blame God to that other person. And then the other verse we know so well, John 3, 16, 17, and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's pretty similar to what we just read earlier in the other scripture. Then it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So you have no right to condemn the world either, okay? Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. What, a, what an incredible verse because it, it has just enough theology in it to spell out the human condition. Jesus did not come to condemn the world. The world was condemned already. The world was in trouble. That person you're talking to, they're in trouble. They may not, I mean, there are times, trust me, there are times when they feel like, mm, boy, I don't think I made God happy today. They do. They think of God. Every human being has to think of God. There's something imprinted in us. And our job is to set the world free from condemnation because that was Jesus' job. And we do it one person at a time. So whoever believes in him will live forever. And the greatest motivating factor, and this is what the church today needs, is motivation. The greatest motivating factor in sharing the gospel for any one of us should be the fact that anyone who dies without knowing Christ as their Savior is doomed to an eternity in hell. And that drove me crazy for 30 years. I could not envision my dad going to hell. And thankfully, he's not there. That really should motivate every one of us to tell our family and friends. And, you know, I know we always think we have more time. We always think we have more time. Like, yeah, I, I didn't do, I'll, you know, I'll get to him. I'll wait for the moment to be just right. Now, we need to have a little more urgency. I want to encourage you concerning the basics of witnessing. Just tell others the truth. Look for opportunities to tell them the truth. And do that outside the church, of course. But you can also invite them to just come and see. Express some excitement about our life groups or about our Sunday services. And invite them. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for how simple it really should be to be a witness, just to tell others what we believe. And, and Lord, to live it out too. Lord, and I, God, none of us are perfect. Jesus was the only perfect person without sin, no sin at all. And Lord, there are times we're going to mess up, but we know that you'll still use us. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would use us, that you would motivate us to tell our loved ones, those may be backslidden, those who have never heard. Those who just kind of rebuked us and maybe rebuffed us. Lord, that we give them another chance and just invite them to come to a church as churchy. That they would come and see that you, we, have found the Messiah. We ask it in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen, I want us to do something real practical, and this is really easy. In the seat back in front of you is a Connect card. On the other side is where you could list prayer requests. I'd like you to take that card out. There's a pen there. It should be a pen there. I want you to write down. Would you write down just a few names of people that you will commit to pray for? Family members who you know need Christ. They need Jesus. I want us to do it before we leave. I'm gonna, we're going to pause just for a moment. And just you can add other names later. But would you? I'll tell you what, just for the sake of time, would you add one name at least? Put one name of someone who you love who does not know Jesus. Put their name on there and begin to pray for them. Take that home, okay? We don't want you to turn it in anywhere here. We're not going to pray for them. You're going to pray for them. And I really believe that just by praying for them, they're going to become more and more, if they aren't, if they aren't already, they're going to become more and more heavy on your heart. And you're really going to, you're going to pray more deeply. You're going to pray that God do something. And the beauty is too, I talked about prayer a few weeks ago. When we pray, he hears us and he answers prayer. So let's do that first and then wait and see what doors God opens up. Pray and invite. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to pray again.
But let's stand together as I pray, because I'm going to pray for this, and then I'm going to go ahead and dismiss you in prayer. Let's stand together. Lord God, we know the reality of what you have done in our lives. God, you have turned our lives upside down. You have proven yourself to be real. Lord, you've saved us from our past, from being condemned as the world stands condemned already without you. Lord, you have brought incredible change into our lives and everyone around us, around us needs this. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that we would come up with a list of people who need you and, God, that we would seek you on their behalf. And, Lord, that you'd touch their hearts, that you'd soften their hearts, that you'd begin to bring conviction into their lives. And you can do that through circumstances. You will do it by your own Holy Spirit. So, Lord, when we go to pick that fruit and we reach out and say, would you come to church with me this coming Sunday? Or have you ever thought about who Jesus was? Whatever it takes. God, whether, whether it be come and see or us going and telling. Lord, I pray, God, that we would see new doors open, that we'd see hearts that are open and receptive to the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way. Lord, I pray that you'd use each one of us. And Father God, now I pray your blessing in each one of our lives. Lord, I pray that you would use us. We're yours. And we give you thanks, Lord. We ask your blessing on today and this week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.